Okay, so now we look at PIM, <coughs> Protocol Independent Multicast. We want to understand how it works and how to configure it. <coughs> so still on multicast. Eh? So multicast packets are sent to a specific group of receivers, which may be distributed distributed at any locations on the network. Now, to forward multicast packets correctly and efficiently, multicast routers need to create and maintain what we call multicast routing entries. Uh, so just like we have uh, uh, an IP routing table that is used for forwarding unicast packets, so we also need a, a multicast routing table mm -hmm. to maintain the routing entries for multicast data. So as more multicast routing protocols and applications are used, people realize that if multicast routes are dynamically generated by multiple routing algorithms like unicast routes, it will be too complex for different routing protocols to import routes of each other. So generally, we don't want to use uh, other, we don't want to use other routing protocols uh, to do multicast routing. So for that purpose, PIM, PIM, which is Protocol Independent Multicast, implements what we call RPF, reverse path forwarding, checks for multicast packets based on unicast routing tables, as you're going to see, and then creates multicast routing entries and forwards multicast packets accordingly. Uh, so that is what we want to check in this particular topic. So by the end of this chapter, you should be able to, number one, a volunteer. <coughs> Under, understand multicast forwarding requirement? Yes. Master beam, uh, beam working mechanism? <coughs> yes. Master PIM SIM working mechanism and configuration. Yes, thank you very much. PIM DM and PIM SM. Okay. So let's begin by relooking at the multicast forwarding requirements. This is something we looked at again in the previous topic. So generally, with multicast packets, a router forwards multicast packets based on <clears throat> number one, whether there are receivers on the network segment connected to that interface. Number two, whether data of which groups is required by the receiver. Uh, so we saw that manually configuring uh, this particular requirement, uh, specifying that this one is in this group, uh, this router has someone in this group, manually configuring that, uh, leads to a number of issues which we already discussed. Mm. Cannot be real time. The flexibility is low because it cannot cater for changes. Uh, also provides huge workload and high probability, introduces high probability of errors in the configuration process. So for that matter, PIM or protocol independent, <clears throat> Protocol independent multicast was introduced. Okay, so please mute your mic. Please mute your mic. I think someone's mic is up. <clears throat> so, protocol independent multicast. So, PIM is protocol independent multicast. <clears throat> the common version of PIM that is being used. Uh, PIM is PIM version two. Uh, now, generally, PIM packets 
are encapsulated in IP packets. Uh, in IP packets with a protocol ID of 103. Eh? Remember the protocol field of the IP header? Uh, so if it's a PIM packet, it's going to have a value of 103. Now, this particular protocol helps us, helps us to uh, create a multicast forwarding path from the multicast source to the multicast destination. Mm. This multicast, this multicast forwarding path, uh, this multicast forwarding path from the source to the destination is normally referred to as a multicast distribution tree or MDT, a multicast distribution tree. Uh, so in a multicast distribution tree, each link, each link transmits a single copy uh, of identical data, uh, of the multicast data actually. So there's no link that is doing duplicate copies. So that's what we are calling a multicast distribution tree. Eh? Then also, uh, on an MDT, we also have replication. Replication of multicast data starts at the junction point as far from the multicast source as possible. So replication of the multicast data where we are now going to distribute, distribute it to the receivers. It starts at the at the at the far end. Now, generally, PIM has two working modes. So the first one is called PIM dense mode. Sorry. So that is what we are calling PIM DM. And the second working mode is known as PIM sparse sparse mode. So that is what we're calling PIM DM, ASM. So we're going to learn about how these two uh, protocols work, the dense mode and <clears throat> the dense mode and the, uh, and the sparse mode. Uh, generally, this one does what you call a push, while this one does what you call a pull. Mm. So what do we mean by a push? In a push, PMDM assumes that everyone in the network uh, requires the multicast data and therefore simply shares the multicast data to all the network segments, uh, regardless of whether we have people that need that multicast data are in that group or not. Eh? So that is what we call dense mode. On the other hand, with uh, sparse mode, it is people who want data from certain groups that have to request. So they have to request. Mm. They have to request data. Uh, so that is what happens when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, uh, PIM SM. <clears throat> okay. So with that in mind, let's begin by having an overview of uh, PIMDM. <clears throat> so PIMDM uses the push mode to forward multicast packets. Uh, generally, uh, PIMDM is used in a densely distributed network, like a campus network, where majority, majority of the people might require that particular data. Uh, so the key task of PIMDM is to establish what we call uh, the shortest path tree from the source, from the source of the multicast data to the receivers. Eh? Now, generally, uh, PIM, uh, PIMDM uh, has to achieve the following processes. 
So one of them is neighbor discovery. The other one is flood and prune. Then we have another one called the state refresh and we have graft and we have a sat. So we have to understand each of these. Uh, what happens in each of these processes. Okay, so let's begin with uh, the neighbor discovery. <clears throat> so we begin with the neighbor discovery. So generally in a PIM network, <clears throat> sorry, uh, in a PIM network, just like in many other protocols we've looked at, uh, routers will send hello messages to other routers in order to discover them and establish neighbor relationships with them. The hello interval when it comes to PIMDM is actually 30 seconds. So after every 30 seconds, a router will send. Uh, will send, uh, uh, will send a hello message in order to discover the neighbor. The other purpose of the hello message is to also find out if the neighbor is still up. Mm -hmm. And therefore, with PIM, uh, we have what we call the hold time, the hold time interval, uh, the hold time interval. So this whole time interval is normally set to 105 seconds. The default is 105 seconds. So that means that if RTB sends three hello, hello messages to RTA and RTA does not reply. Uh, so every time it sends a hello message, then the timer starts counting down. So if it gets to 100, if it expires, it gets to zero, then we assume that RTA is down. Otherwise, if RTA responds, then we reset. We reset this particular whole time, uh, whole time timer. So that's how we detect if a neighbor has gone down. Okay, now in PIMDM, we also have a DR in scenarios where we have more than a single router on, uh, on the same network segment. So like here we have RTC and RTD. So we have to select one router to act as the designated router. Now, the election here is based on the router priority or the largest IP address. The election of the DR in PIM DM is very similar to the election of the DR in PIM SM. Similarly, how to form neighbor relationships is also the same in PIM SM. So as I've said, we elect, we elect, uh, <clears throat> we elect a DR number one based on the router priority priority so the one that has, has the highest if they all have the same router priority then we go ahead and choose highest ip address highest ip address now what is the dr4 you remember in the previous topic we talked of the query so the dr is simply the query when we were looking at IGMP version one, we talk of the query. So if RTC here is elected as the DR, then it's only RTC that will propagate down multicast data. Otherwise, RTD is going to disable uh, the sharing of multicast data via this uh, downstream interface. So only this one is going to be so the DR acts as the query. Okay. If the DR goes down, elections, elections are triggered again. So that is how the hello neighbor relationship is established in PMDM and also in PMSM. Now let's also look at, uh, uh huh. Let's look at the other processes. So we have a process called flooding. <clears throat> so 
So what is flooding? Now, when it comes to flooding, as we've said, PMDM assumes, PMDM assumes that everyone, that everyone in the network, uh, that all hosts on a network are ready to receive multicast data. Uh, <clears throat> so really, when a router receives multicast data, it simply forwards it uh, to, the other, to the other routers. Mm. But before that, it has to perform what we call RPF. RPF is reverse path, reverse path forwarding. So wh wh what that means, uh, the purpose of RPF is to determine if you've received that particular multicast packet uh, from the correct upstream interface. Uh, what that means is this. Eh? So here, we might also have an interconnection between RTD and RTC. Eh? And after RTD receives that multicast packet, it might also forward it to RTC like that. Eh? But you see, uh, the most reliable uh, link, the, the uplink, because these three routers are on the same level. So the uplink for, sorry, <clears throat> the uplink, the correct upstream interface that is closest to the source is actually this guy and not this particular, this particular interface here. So really, when it comes to reverse path forwarding check, you just want to confirm that indeed you've received that multicast packet on the correct upstream interface, the one that offers the shortest path to the source. Eh? Simply put, that is it. Mm. So uh, if you receive a multicast packet from an incorrect interface, then you simply discard that multicast packet. We simply discard that particular multicast packet. That way, we are able to create an SPT. That way, we are able to create a shortest path tree from the source to all the other, to all the other uh, 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 routes on the network. Because you can only accept the multicast packet from the correct upstream interface. So I hope you understand uh, what that means. Okay, then uh, the, last, uh, the last bit after RPF check is what we call pruning. Is what we call pruning. Mm. Now, as we've said, during the flooding, during the flooding, multicast packets are sent to everyone. But now, what if, for example, client B does not require, so this particular guy does not require the multicast packet. Uh, so what they do is that they trigger a prune process. They trigger a prune process. So uh, <clears throat> as we saw in IGMP, client B will simply send a report message to RTE. Mm. Then RTE will send a message to the upstream router, which is RTC. So it will send a message to RTC telling RTC that, hey, I do not have anyone in my network who requires this multicast packet. And therefore, RTC will delete, will delete the downstream interface, uh, the downstream interface from this multicast group. Therefore, it's not going to forward uh, multicast packets anymore uh, in this direction to this router RTE. So that is what you call pruning. That is what you call pruning. So pruning is simply saying, hey, we, we don't want to receive this multicast packet. Because after all, in the beginning, during flooding, everyone receives it. Now, <clears throat> each pruned interface, for example here, we've said this interface that is connected to RT is going to be pruned, eh? meaning that we're not going to send packets to it, uh, multicast packet from that group from group one. You're not going to send multicast packet because no one needs it in this network. Now, each pruned interface has a timer. 
Now, when this timer expires, when this timer expires, it triggers what we call a flood prune process. Now, this particular timer uh, by default is actually 120 seconds. Ah, sorry, 210. <clears throat> 210 seconds. Or you can call it three minutes. Mm. So that means that a flood prune process will repeat on every pruned interface after every three minutes. Uh. So what, what does the flood prune process do? It simply says that uh, after three minutes, uh, this pruned interface will be re-enabled and therefore multicast packet will be forwarded again. So RTE, if no one wants that packet, it has to send the stop message again. Hey, stop sending me this multicast. So after every three minutes, uh, they have to go through that kind of interaction. So that is what we call the flood prune process. Happens after every three minutes. As you might have already guessed correctly, these causes are waste of network resources, especially the bandwidth. Uh, so the solution, uh, the solution to that flood prune processing process is what we call the state refresh. A state refresh. So really, the state refresh prevents a waste of network resources caused by the periodic flood prune process that we've seen reoccurs after every three minutes. Uh, so what happens is that uh, in the state refresh procedure, uh, the router that is actually interconnecting the source of the multicast packet periodically sends the state refresh message. Now, this state refresh message, uh, what it does is that it resets the prune timer. It resets the prune timer on all the routers. Mm. It resets the prune timer on all the routers. So you remember, we said that this guy has been pruned, so it cannot forward. So when it receives the state refresh, when it is pruned, it sets the timer, 120 seconds, uh, to 10, to 10 seconds. So it sets the timer and starts counting down. Uh, so if that timer expires to zero, then they go through the flood prune, the flood prune process again. So what happens is this, uh, with state refresh, if they've set uh, that seconds and it's counting down, maybe it's 150, 150 seconds, when the router receives a state refresh, it simply resets the timer to 210 for any pruned interface. So thereby, it's going to prevent, it's going to prevent the regular uh, flood prune process that might occur on the network. So that is the purpose of the state refresh, state refresh message. Is that clear? Anyone, is that clear? Hello, are you there guys? Yes. Can, can, can you can you please repeat it, Kidogo? Yes, I can. Okay. So, uh, to Mesema, a PMDM in a tuma multicast data kwa kila mtu. Hadi mtu ataki. So, like client B will receive the data. So, when client D receives it and he does not want the data, it will send it will send a report message to RTE and RTE will forward it to RTC saying, hey, no one in my network requires this multicast. And therefore, this guy is going to prune. Pruning is simply stopping that interface from sharing that multicast data anymore. Now, when that happens, 
it sets a timer. That timer is 210 seconds. 210 seconds. Now, when this timer, when this timer expires, when it gets to zero seconds again, uh, RTC will start flooding, flooding the multicast, multicast to RTE again. Uh, so RTE has to initiate, it has to initiate the prune, the prune again. So these will happen after every three minutes, after every, after every three minutes. So how can we prevent this? Because these will consume network resources uh, after every three minutes. So to avoid this from happening, this router that is connected to the source of the multicast will be sending a packet we call a state refresh, uh, state refresh packet. This packet will be sent along, <clears throat> along the multicast distribution tree so that every router along the distribution tree will get the state refresh. Now, if a router gets the state refresh, they will, they will reset the timer for any of their pruned interfaces. And so they'll reset it to the initial value, which is 200 and seconds. And therefore, that will reduce the amount of flood prune uh, processes that we might have in the network. So is it clearer now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so we've seen the state refresh, but what if client B now wants to join group one? How can, how can that happen? Uh, yet we, we've blocked, we've blocked multicast packets. Uh, so what happens if client B wants to join uh, group one, receive multicast from group one? So how that can happen is through what we call the graft mechanism, the graft mechanism. So used to enable new group members to qu quickly receive multicast packets. So let's see how that happens. So this guy now wants to join group one Remember, RTC was no longer forwarding packets from group one uh, in this direction. So this guy will send, a, will send a report message to RTE saying, hey, I want to join group one. Remember, this is simply a multicast uh, address. Then RTE will then send what we call a graft message to RTC, then RTC will respond with a graft acknowledgement. Then after RTC responds to the graft acknowledgement, it's now going to begin forwarding multicast packets uh, from group one to RTE and RTE will now deliver it to client B. So that is what we call the graft mechanism. Is that clear? Anyone with an issue or a question? Okay, so let's look at the other mechanism known as the ASAT mechanism. Uh, ASAT mechanism. <coughs> oh, sorry. So the ASAT mechanism is used to suppress duplicate multicast packets. Mm. So if you're receiving the same multicast packets and your three routers on the same shared network segment, eh? on the same network segment. So we don't need, we don't need all of you to share the multicast to share the multicast packet. So, because that will mean we have three identical multicast data streams on the network. 
So we don't want you to do that. We don't want you to share uh, multicast packets. Now, to prevent this problem, to prevent this problem, uh, every multicast router on a shared network segment will send what we call uh, a multicast assert message to all the other routers. Mm. The destination address for an assert message, destination address for an assert, assert message is 224.0.0.13. So that is the destination address. Now, after receiving an assert message uh, from another router, you have to go into what we call an assert election. Uh, an assert election. Now, the criteria, the criteria for the assert election is, first of all, it selects uh, router, <clears throat> router with smallest preference value of the unicast route to the multicast source. So initially it will look at that. Then it will also look at router with, if, if the preference value is the same, to the to the multicast source, then it looks at the the cost. So router with the smallest route cost to the multicast source. Eventually, if the two, if the two, uh, sorry, <clears throat> if the two are the same, preference of the unicast route to the multicast source and uh, the route cost to the multicast source, if they're the same, then it goes to the router with the largest downstream interface, uh, sorry, interface, IP address. <coughs> Mm. So where, where does it get the smallest preference value to the source? Of course, from whatever protocol that you're using, IGP, for example. Where does it get a smallest route cost? Again, from the protocol. Uh, so if these two are the same, which might be the case with RTA, RTB, and RTC, then it simply elects based on the IP address of these downstream interfaces. So the one that has the largest, the one that has the largest becomes the, uh, uh, becomes the winner of the assert election. Okay. So what that means, for example, if RTA wins the assert election here, then uh, RTB and RTC are not going to send multicast packets on these network segments. Eh? So that's the purpose of the assert elections. So only RTA is going to send. Eh? So please remember that. <clears throat> okay, so let's see how, how to configure so here is the source. So we're not configuring anything in the source. Here is the router that is connected to the source. So this is how we configure uh, PIMDM. So we begin by enabling multicast uh, on the interface view. Then we go to all the interface, all the interfaces that are forwarding multicast packets. And we specify PIMDM as the multicast mod, as the PIM mod that we want to use. So PIMDM, like that. 
Okay, so let's look at uh, this one here. And just the same thing again. So you enable multicast, and then you go to every interface that is forwarding multicast packets, G00, G001, and you specify the PIM mode as PIMDM. And generally, uh, you're just going to repeat the same process in all the other in all the other routers to enable them to exchange data using PIMDM. So you can always use the display command, display PIM routing table. For example, here we are on RTD. Let me just go back. So RTD is this one. Uh, sorry. So RTD is here directly connected to RTA. So let's see. <clears throat> so we can see, uh, I'm not sure whether I talked of uh, star, did I talk about star comma G and, uh, and S comma G? Uh, I should have talked about this, but I'm still going to talk about it uh, in a short while. I'm sorry, I must have forgotten to talk about it. In fact, I should not just talk about it right now. Eh? So here we have the source, uh, the source of the multicast. So the source address, which is the IP address of RTA, which is directly connected to RTD. Then this is the group. So the group is simply the multicast uh, address, the multicast address. Uh, now, um, mm -hmm. how can I put this? Um, so we, we have S there. Uh, S simply means uh, source, source, source of the multicast source of the multicast packet. So S actually is specific, specific source of the multicast packet. G uh, is the group, group, uh, simply multicast, multicast IP address. <coughs> Star, stands for any source, any source. So when you have many sources, you can use star comma G. Now PIMDM supports both star comma G and also S comma G. Uh, but PIMSM, as we're going to see, supports only one of them. Eh? So I hope I got that correctly, okay. <clears throat> So other, other details you can see, for example, is that we are using PIMDM. <coughs> we can see that the upstream interface is that guy. And uh, we can also see the upstream neighbor. We can see the downstream interface. Mm -hmm. This guy. And you can see the protocol it's using and the time it's been up and so on and so forth. We can also do display PIM neighbor uh, in order to see the neighbor. <clears throat> so you can see the neighbor is RTA uh, connected via this interface and so on and so forth. So those are some of the details that you see when you display that, okay. So let's go to the limitations of PIMDM. Now, generally, PIMDM is applicable to campus networks with densely distributed group members, meaning most of the people are in that network or network segments. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the problem with uh, PIMDM 
on a network with sparsely distributed group members, like the internet, like the internet. Periodic flooding. So sparsely distributed means uh, people that are supposed to receive the multicast data are on different, 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 and, and uh, large geographical areas, different uh, geographical areas. Mm -hmm. So periodic flooding of multicast traffic will bring great pressure to the network. Uh, will bring great pressure to the network. So the applicability, for example, of PMDM is only on local networks, while now the solution to the limitations of PMDM which is PMSM, sparse mode, from sparsely distributed, sparsely, so sparse mode, mm -hmm. uh, cutters for this particular problem. Because instead of using a push, instead of using a push, PMSM uses a pull. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, the working mechanism of uh, PMSM. So PMSM uses the pool mode to forward multicast packets. The pool mode. So with PMSM, it assumes that the group members are distributed sparsely on a network. Uh, and almost all network segments have no group members. So that is the assumption that PMSM makes. While PMDM makes the assumption that almost all network segments have a group member. Uh, so this one makes the assumptions that all network segments have no group members. Mm. <clears throat> now, as I said, PMSM is usually used for networks with a large number of sparsely distributed group members, like the internet. Uh, now, the key tasks of uh, PMSM is number one, it has to set up what we call an RPT or rendezvous point tree. Mm. And number two, it has to set up an S SPT, shortest path tree. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Shortest path tree. Now, generally, uh, rendezvous means a meeting point. Rendezvous. It means a meeting point. Uh, so, a rendezvous point tree is actually created between the source router. Uh, and a router in the in the network, one of the routers in the network. Uh, while the shortest path tree is created between a rendezvous point and the last hop router, that is the router that shares uh, that particular multicast packet to the receiver. Mm. Now. Uh, PMSM also has uh, has the following. Uh, it has the following uh, processes: neighbor discovery, DR election, DR election. Then it has the RP or rendezvous point discovery. It has another process which is the RPT setup. Then after that, we have the uh, SPT, generally uh, shortest path tree. SPT uh, setup. Then we also have what we call a SPT switch over. Switch over. And lastly, it also has an assert. An assert process. Uh, now generally, 
neighbor discovery is very similar. Uh, neighbor discovery is very similar to PIMDM and also their SAT mechanism is also very similar to PIMDM. So we are not going to go through that. We've already gone through the DR election. So we're also going to see uh, the other processes in the subsequent slides. So let's begin with the rendezvous point. <clears throat> so the rendezvous point acts, it acts as the root node of an RPT. It acts as the root node of a rendezvous point tree. So all multicast traffic on the shared tree is forwarded to receivers by a rendezvous point. Uh -huh. <clears throat> now all PIM routers on the network need to know the rendezvous point's location. Mm. So really the rendezvous point is the meeting point. It is, it is actually the meeting point uh, of the distribution of this particular, uh, of uh, this particular multicast data. So we are going to see a, a diagram in a short while. But in the meantime, uh, a rendezvous point can be, it can be selected uh, by two ways. Number one, is by stati stati uh, statically, statically uh, configuring it. So statically configuring a rendezvous point, or it can be dynamically, uh, dynamically selected. <clears throat> so how do we choose a router that will act as the meeting point, uh, as the rendezvous point? Now, statically means really you specify the rendezvous point address on each PMSM router. Uh, so with this one, you specify. You specify, we're going to see in the configuration, you specify uh, the RP address on all the PIM routers. Uh, so that's the first thing. Mm. Now, with dynamically selected, with dynamically selected, here you have to specify multiple. You have to specify multiple candidate, candidate RPs. They are normally referred to as CRPs. So only members, only routers that have been specified as candidate RPs, only routers that have been specified as candidate RPs can be elected using this particular protocol dynamically. Mm -hmm. Now, generally, we have certain recommendations when it comes to the configuration of a rendezvous point. For example, on a small network, a small to medium network, it is advised that you configure an RP statically uh, because these will not put a lot of pressure on the low end devices. But on a large network, you need to configure an RP dynamically. Uh, also, if you have a single source, if you have a single multicast source in your network, you're advised to configure that particular router that is interconnected to that source, multicast source, you configure it statically to be the RP. So that is the gateway, the gateway of that multicast source you configure it as a rendezvous point. Hmm. Okay. So I hope we will remember those two methods 
which can be used to select a rendezvous point. <clears throat> okay, so this is the figure that I told you about. So here, we can see we have the source. We have this router that is interconnecting the source. But now, this router has been selected uh, as the rendezvous point. So what that means is that every multicast packet from that source must come to this guy before it's, it's distributed over the network. So all multicast packets must come to the rendezvous point. And that's why we've said that every router in your network, every PIM router must be aware of the rendezvous point. So it's simply the meeting point where all the multicast packets will meet before they are distributed further downwards. Uh, so an RPT setup uh, follows the, the following uh, process. Uh, so step number one, so red here is an IGMP report. So step number one, client, client one. So, sorry, let me just make, make something clear. There's something I think I said that was not right. Um, an RPT is created from the rendezvous point all the way to the, all the way to the receivers, while an SPT, an SPT is created from the source to the rendezvous point. So an SPT is created here from the source to the rendezvous point, but an RPT created here. Uh, to the receivers. Okay, so how the RPT is created? So this guy requests to join uh, a particular group. Uh, so they send a message to this router, hey, I need to join group one. Now when the router receives that, they are going to send uh, to the next router what we call a join message. And the join message is going to be star comma G. So star comma G means it can be from any source, but we've specified the group that we want, the multicast address. Eh? So this guy, remember all these routers know the rendezvous point. So this guy is also going to send, is also going to send to the rendezvous point. Now when the rendezvous point gets uh, when the rendezvous point uh, gets that particular message, now it's going to send the multicast packet, the multicast packet over the same path, and that particular path is what we call an RPT, the rendezvous point tree to that particular client. Uh, so generally that is how a rendezvous point tree is created. So what happens if two routers are connected to client A? Uh, will the two routers both send a join message to the RP? What do you think about that question? If two routers are connected to client A, are both of them going to send a join message? to the rendezvous point? Yes or no? Anyone? Okay, so of course the answer is no, because we have an assert winner. Eh? Okay, so, uh, in a, uh, in a PMSM network, we have two types of DRs. So PMSM DRs. So the first DR is called the receiver. The receiver DR. The second one is known as the source DR. So the receiver DR is connected to the source of the multicast. Eh? Ah, no. The receiver DR, the source DR, is connected to the source of the multicast. 
So this is the source. So uh, someone here is going to be elected as the source DR. Then the receiver DR are these routers that are connected to that are connected to the receiver. So again, one of them is going to be elected as the receiver DR. Uh, now, generally, in regards to the rendezvous point, in regards to the rendezvous point, the receiver DR, when it receives a report message from the client, hey, I want to join uh, group one, I want to join group one. So the receiver DR will send a join message to the rendezvous point. The, rende uh, the join message is a star comma G, meaning it can be from any source, but I have specified the group I want to join. Mm. So that is the purpose of the receiver DR. On the other hand, the source DR is used to send what you call a register message register message. So send a unicast register message to the rendezvous point. Uh, so the purpose, uh, the purpose of registering on the rendezvous point is so that all the multicast henceforth from this source will be sent directly to the rendezvous point before it is distributed to other parts of the network. Uh, so that's the purpose of registering with the rendezvous point. And the router that does that registration is the source DR. So let's look at the process of how uh, SPT uh, is, uh, is created. Eh? So you remember I said, uh, previously I said that uh, an RPT is created from the RP downwards, while an SPT is created from the source to the RP. Eh? So we want to see how the STP is actually created. <coughs> okay, so a multicast source, a multicast source will first send a packet to the source DR. Now, when it receives the multicast packet, when the source DR receives the multicast packet, it will encapsulate it in what we call a register message. Register message. So if you see this step number two here, it's gonna send a register message to the rendezvous point in unicast mode because it is aware. When we are configuring, you'll see that everyone is aware of who the RP is. So they're going to send a register message. Now, when this guy receives the register message, step number two here, it's going to decapsulate that packet and send that multicast packet uh, via the RPT to the destination, to the, the, the receiver. Let me say to the receiver. Now, in the meanwhile, the RP will also send what we call a join message to the source DR. So that is what is happening here in step number four uh, with this gray. So, so it will send a, a, a join message. So join message specifies the source and the source of the multicast and the group. The source and the group. SG, like that. So when it is sending, all the routers along the line also record the S stroke G uh, path, thereby creating an SPT. So thereby creating the shortest path tree on step number five there. So that is the process of creating the shortest path tree in a PIM SM network. So generally, uh, this is what I had said earlier, that uh, PIM DM 
only supports a specific source. You have to specify a specific source. Uh, you have to specify a specific source. While on PMSM, on PMSM, you can use any source uh, or use a specific source. Uh, so the scenario, so this one, SPT from the first hop router to the last hop router. So PIMDM establishes an STP only. The only multicast distribution tree that PIMDM comes up with is an SPT from the router that is connected to the source of the multicast packet to the router that is interconnecting the receiver device. Okay, star comma G, this one normally sent uh, through the RTP from the RP to the last hop router. From the rendezvous point to the last hop router. So by now you know the last hop router connects the receiver. S comma G is for the SPT. So this is the other tree that is created from the SPT, uh, either from the source DR to the RP. When we are sending a register message mm, or from the first hop router to the last hop router, when we create, when we do an SPT switch over, SPT switch over. So you can also use specific source uh, at that particular point. Okay. So are there, are there any potential problems with uh, those two forwarding trees? Uh, the answer is yes. Because the path from the multicast source to the receiver may not always be the optimal path, as we can see in this example. So for example, you, you can clearly see uh, given that, for example, the bandwidth is the same for all the links, you can see that if we forward this packet, if we forward it like this, that's the optimal path, rather than going through this direction, rather than going through this direction. So this one is the, is the, is the path that has been used because we have to go through the RPA, eh? but unfortunately, is it the optimal? Path? No, not the optimal path. Mm -hmm. Not the optimal path. Uh. So remember, we, we are forwarding based on the SPT, that is between the source, router, and the rendezvous point. Then we follow the RPT. The RPT is between the rendezvous point and the last hop router. So it is not always, does not always provide the optimal path. So what is the solution to this problem? Uh, the solution to this problem is now what we are calling the SPT switch over, the SPT switch over, the SPT switch over. Now, uh, In a PMSM, the DR, the DR, the receiver DR, the receiver DR uh, normally checks uh, the rate of multicast data packets that are sent from the RP. So it checks, and uh, if that particular packet, multicast packet that is being sent from the RP, uh, if it exceeds, if it exceeds uh, what you call the threshold, the threshold, which is the maximum amount of delay that is, uh, which is the maximum amount of delay that is allowed on the network, then it triggers, 
it triggers an SPT, SPT switchover. Now, uh, we've said that from the source, every multicast packet has to go through the rendezvous point. What problems do you think that can that can result to? Uh, uh, if there are so many receivers on the network, then the rendezvous point might be overwhelmed. We might have congestion on this link and also on on the other links that the downstream links that are sending the the multicast packet. Uh, so that is the other problem. Other than the problem of having uh, of following a, a, a path that is not the optimal path. The other problem is sometimes the rendezvous point might be overwhelmed. When it is overwhelmed, the, the threshold, hmm, the delay threshold is going to be exceeded. When that happens, now it's gonna trigger uh, an SPT switch over. So let's look at this. So when the DR, when the receiver DR detects that the rate of received multicast packets exceeds the threshold, it sends it sends an S comma G. So you specify the source, uh, join message, join message to the multicast source. So you're now sending a join message directly to the multicast source. So of course, this packet is going to follow the optimal, the optimal path, because it's going to use the routing protocol that has been configured. Hmm. Now, when that happens, step number two happens. Now, that particular path that has been followed by the join message, uh, is going now to be the new SPT for this multicast data. Mm. For this multicast data. So uh, going forward, going forward, any multicast data destined for client A is going to be forwarded from the source to that guy, then to this guy, then to this guy, then delivered to client A. Uh, so we are no longer using this SPT. So that's why we call it SPT switchover. We are not using that. We are now creating uh, an SPT all the way from the source to the receiver. Mm. Now, uh, because you've done that, you now have to prune some branches on the shared tree. Uh, so what that simply means because the source is now sending this multicast data via this router, you have to you have to stop accepting multicast data from the rendezvous point so that you don't have duplicate multicast data. So that is the process of the SPT switch over. You can read more about it. So let's see how the SPT configuration is done. Uh, in this case, we are uh, specifying the rendezvous point uh, manually or statically. So we are choosing RTD as the rendezvous point. So let's begin with uh, the first hop router. We want to call it the first hop router because it's connected to the source of the multicast packet. Uh, here are the configuration commands. So we enable multicast uh, under system view. Then we go ahead and go to each interface and specify the P mode as SM. Now, after enabling PIM, uh, after enabling PIM on the interfaces, we also enable PIM on system view by just typing PIM, ah oh, no, we go into PIM view. So we type PIM, 
then we'll go into PIM view. Then you now do static static hyphen RP 4.4.4.4. So you're simply specifying RTD as the rendezvous point. So that's why we say that everyone must be aware of the rendezvous point uh, in the multicast network. So similarly, uh, on RTB, we'll also do the same things and eventually go to PIM view and specify the rendezvous point. So when you're specifying the rendezvous point, you specify the router ID of the router. And so static hyphen RP 4.4.4.4. And generally, you do you repeat the same procedure. You repeat the same procedure on all the other routers, enabling PMSM in uh, the specific interfaces uh, and configuring statically the uh, the rendezvous points. Okay. So if you do. Uh, display PIM routing table. We are on RTF. Let's see where RTF is. So this is RTF. It is interconnected directly to RTD. Uh huh. So if we if we look at that, uh, we can see that we are using star comma G. So it can be the source can be any. That is what star means. But this is the group we want to join. The multicast group we want to join. The rendezvous point is 4.4.4. The protocol we are using is that one. So we can see that the upstream interface is G stroke zero stroke zero. We can also see the downstream interface is G stroke zero stroke zero stroke one. And we can see the neighbor. It is directly connected to RTD. So the neighbor is 10.1.46.4. Uh, okay, let's also do this on RTB. Uh, display PIM neighbor. So let's look at RTB. Uh, so where is RTB? RTB is interconnected to RTA. You can see connected to RTA on 000, connected to RTC, connected to RTD. Uh, so we can see the neighbors here, that it has three neighbors. Uh, so we can see router one, router three, and router four. See that by looking at the, the last bit of the IP address there. And the interface via which they have been interconnected to. So these are the PIM neighbors for RTB. So that is how you check the neighbors. Okay, so we have a scenario here, which we can, uh, which we can look at. We can go through this scenario. So, can one of us help us read uh, uh, read the different parts of this particular scenario as we try to comprehend it? A volunteer. Uh, comprehensive multicast experiment. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, just be a little bit louder. Awesome. On the network shown in the figure, uh -huh. deploy, deploy PIMSM. I just call it specify PIMSM. Oh, PIMSM. Yeah, that's how it's referred to. So PIMSM, eh? Uh -huh, go ahead. The pay, the pay PMSM and specify root B as the static RP uh, rendezvous points. Uh -huh, so what what are we supposed to do here? So deploy PMSM, specify RTB as the static rendezvous point. Mm. So what are we supposed to do in the interfaces here, in all the interfaces of this router? So the P mode that we are supposed to specify is PMSM. Eh? 
and of course also enable multicast routing on each of the routers. Then also we have to use the static hyphen RP command to specify RTB as the rendezvous point. So that's what we are supposed to do generally. Uh -huh. Let's move on. The next one. Configure IGMP version two on the user networks and take measures to minimize resource consumption on the user networks and improve network security. Aha, uh -huh. so we are supposed to improve the network security and do measures to minimize resource consumption on the user networks. Mm. Anyone who can guess what we are supposed to do in order to do that, in order to achieve this too, uh, the clue is here. What happens when the switch receives a multicast packet? Huh? So a switch will broadcast the multicast packet. Eh? You remember, it will broadcast the multicast packet. And therefore, if we don't want it to broadcast the multicast packet, and we want it to establish a layer two multicast forwarding table, we have to enable, we have to enable, what do we call it? IGMP, it starts with an S. We have to enable what in this switch so that it does not flood packets. IGMP, snooping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have to enable IGMP snooping. I understand that you guys are a little bit tired. IGMP snooping, we have to enable it in switch A. Okay, I have the next one. So we learn IGMP snooping, minimize resource consumption on the user network. User network means the end, the end network. Eh? Will it achieve that? Will it improve network security? The answer is yes. yes. Uh, move on. Uh, router E and router F are connected to re receivers. Set up an RTP from the uh, rendezvous point to the router E. So set up an RPT. Uh, from the rendezvous point. Uh, so we are talking of these guys, RTE and RTF. So you can see RTE and RTF are connected to the same network segment. Eh? So they're connected to the same network segment. Uh, so how do we then create an RPT from the RP to RTE and not through RTF. Uh, so that means that this guy has to be elected as the DR. It means that RTE has to be elected as the DR for that particular network segment. Uh, so that the RPT now is actually formed through, is actually formed through RTE to the RP. So this guy has to be elected as the DR. What can we change on RTE to ensure that it's elected as the DR? Do you still remember the criteria for electing a DR in PMSM? Okay, uh -huh. let's move on, the last one. Um, Ruta D is connected to the VIP user network. The client on this network needs to receive multicast data immediately after joining group 238111. Okay, so we are also going to see how we can statically, uh, how we can statically configure uh, a client to receive a multicast packet from a particular group. So that is that is indeed what we are going to uh, to see here. 
Okay. So, uh -huh. so we can begin with the, this router here, RTA, which is the first hop router. So we enable multicast routing, then we go to the interfaces and specify PIMSM. Then we go to PIM and specify RTB as the rendezvous point statically using that command. Uh, uh. So generally, we are going to repeat the same procedure in all the other routers, in all the other routers the same procedure in all the other routers. You can see in all the other routers, we simply do the same procedure. Enable PMSM on any of the interfaces that is interacting and also specify router B as the rendezvous point. So that's the first thing we have to do. So we are using PMSM and we have router B as the rendezvous point. So what's the next thing? Sorry. <clears throat> so, uh, on this router RTE, we want to enable IGMP snooping. So you can enable IGMP snooping on the global view, on system view, or even on a particular VLAN. For example, you go to VLAN 10, and also enable IGMP snooping so that any frames that are passing through that VLAN uh, are also captured on the layer two multicast table. So that will reduce the number of flooding that the switch does and also improve security. Okay. Uh, RTF, RTF, is also a last hop router because it's connecting to receivers. Therefore, you also have to enable IGMP on this particular interface that is connecting to the receivers. And the IGMP version we've been told to use is IGMP version one, version two, sorry, version two. So remember, you also have to do that for this interface on RTE. Uh, so that is what we are doing here. Uh, now, since we have two routers, RTE and RTF, on the same network segment, we want RTE to be elected as the DR so that the rendezvous point three is, is actually between RTE and not through RTF. Eh? So to do that, we use this command. We use this command. So pim hello hyphen option space dr hyphen priority 100. So we've now changed from the default priority, dr priority, which is one. Eh? The default priority, dr priority is one. So the one with a higher priority value becomes the DR, and therefore RPT will be formed through it. Okay. Now, on RTD, we can configure this interface that is connecting client C, uh, so that automatically it joins this particular group. So how to do that? You go to the interface that is connecting client C and you use the command IGMP static hyphen group. Then you specify the multicast address that defines that group. So once you do this, then automatically client C will always be added to that group. And what that means is that anytime, anytime we have packets for that group, uh, RTD will be forwarding it to RTC. So that is how you can statically uh, add 
a client to a specific group. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, quite a long chapter again. Uh, I saw a question, are we doing HCIA? I want to confirm that we are still doing HCIP. <laughs> HCIA <laughs> is a story for a different day. <laughs> Uh, so can someone assist us? Maybe with the first question. A volunteer? Okay. So I'll let you go through these questions as you relax. So please go through them and uh, try and answer them. If you are unable to, you can always check the answer uh, that has been explained just below this particular page. Anyone with a question? Okay, Santini. 